Our next speaker is another one of my colleagues from Bar Harbor, Jennifer Trowbridge, who's an assistant professor. And she's going to talk about context matters, cell of origin and mutational order in tumorigenesis. Good morning. Uh, thank you to George. It is truly an honor to be included um, such an incredible lineup of speakers at today's symposium, and I'd like to thank both Charles and Ed for the invitation and the opportunity to share with you today the work that is going on in my laboratory, and in particular, a story that we're working on that combines themes of genomics, epigenomics, and human disease. And as I learned from Dr. Green this morning, this is a hot topic in genomics research, so that's very, uh, very exciting. <laughs> So this story revolves around the question and the problem of tumor heterogeneity, or determining how and why different tumor subtypes can arise from the same tissue. There are a couple of models to account for tumor heterogeneity. One is a genetic mutation model, where it is the identity of an oncogenic event, being it a mutation or chromosome translocation, that is responsible for driving a particular subtype of tumor. A second model um, that my laboratory is interested in exploring is the cell of origin model, whereby an identical oncogenic event can occur, but it is in fact the identity of the cell type in which that event occurs that dictates the subtype of tumor that will form. Now, we have uh, genetic and genomic tools in order to uh, investigate the genetic mutations that give rise to tumor genesis in a clinical setting. We do not currently have the knowledge or the tools in order to determine uh, for a patient that presents with a particular type of tumor, what was the cell of origin of that tumor. Um, and so this is really where we're interested in developing some new technologies. Now, my laboratory focuses on the hematopoietic system uh, in order to investigate these questions. And uh, many decades uh, of work by many scientists uh, have contributed to this beautiful slide of uh, the hematopoietic hierarchy, where we have distinct populations of cells, starting from the stem cells at the top, down through various populations of committed and lineage-restricted progenitor cells, that then differentiate to give rise to all of the mature cells of the hematopoietic system. Now, this uh, system is a very powerful one to study because we have cell surface markers and phenotypes that we can use to prospectively isolate each of these populations of cells and to study the consequences of mutations or rearrangements in their ability to generate different types of leukemias, such as AML, that I will be focusing on today. So in my laboratory, we're interested in investigating this question of cell of origin in acute myeloid leukemia. And in order to do this, the initial experiments that we did were to isolate various populations of stem and progenitor and induce expression of a common oncogene. And we chose the fusion protein MLL-AF9, which is known to drive AML. And we asked of the AMLs that form from these distinct cell types of origin, is there a role for cell of origin in the latency of the leukemia or aggressiveness of disease, as well as the response of those leukemias to different therapies, be it conventional chemotherapy or experimental therapies? And so when we did this experiment, inducing MLL-AF9 in these various populations of cells and uh, examining their ability to generate AML in vivo in mice, what we found is that uh, only particular populations of cells are able to be transformed by MLL-AF9, and those are ones that ha already have uh, de novo myeloid potential. So cells that have restricted lymphoid or erythroid potential cannot be transformed by MLL-AF9 to give rise to AML. Now, of the cell types that can be transformed by MLL-AF9, we asked, is there a difference in the latency of disease or aggressiveness of disease? And what we found was that uh, leukemias that are derived from stem cells, as shown in blue here, have the shortest latency or most aggressive AML, 
whereas uh, AMLs that are derived from committed progenitor cell types have a longer latency or less aggressive and less penetrant. And this is independent of oncogene dosage, um, as well as uh, it is not seen in terms of the phenotype of the leukemias that arise. So they're, they're morphologically identical. And so rather than showing this schematic on the left where all of these cell types can be transformed to give rise to a common AML, uh, we think it should look more like this, where distinct populations of normal stem and progenitor cells can be transformed to give rise to AML that has distinct potency or aggressiveness. Now, I mentioned we also uh, looked at the response of these leukemias to um, targeted therapies. And the, one of the drugs that we tested was a DNA methylation inhibitor called decitabine. And this is currently in, uh, in clinical trials as a frontline therapeutic for particular populations of patients with AML. And so we tested two concentrations of this drug and the ability to impair these leukemias derived from distinct cell types of origin. And what we found is that stem cell-derived leukemias uh, are more resistant to, these, to this compound. So they grow better, and we see less apoptosis. Whereas progenitor-derived leukemias are more sensitive to DNA, this DNA methylation inhibitor, where we see uh, that this drug is able to slow down the growth and cause a significant amount of apoptosis. And this is um, uh, done in vitro, so still preliminary in some respects but adds support to the concept that the cell of origin is important uh, when considering um, both the prognosis of a tumor as well as its potential response to different therapeutics. Now, one aspect that we noticed while we were doing these experiments was when we derived cell lines from these different leukemias for the purposes of some other studies and continued to passage these cell lines in culture we found that this effective cell of origin is retained. So after many months of passaging these cells, when we then uh, uh, transplant them back in vivo into mice, we see that the stem cell-derived leukemias are still more aggressive um, with the shortest latency of disease, where the progenitor-derived leukemias have a longer latency or less aggressiveness. And we see this down to limiting dilutions of cells that we transplant in as well, suggesting that this is a cell intrinsic effect. So these, this study uh, led us to propose the hypothesis that here, um, or cellular memory of the cell type of origin in which these tumors arose from. And so we asked the question, is in fact the chromatin state of these various tumors representative of their cell type of origin? And so we've just started to look at this. And the first uh, thing we decided to do was to use a technique, relatively new technique. This is called ATAC-seq, which me measures regions of open chromatin. And so we know from the literature that different populations of stem and progenitor cells in the hematopoietic system have different regions of open chromatin. They also tend to have different enhancers and active enhancers. And so you can see for these two uh, populations of myeloid-committed progenitor cells, they have open chromatin at these particular regions of the genome, whereas in the stem cell population, we don't see um, peaks representing open chromatin. Now, we've started to profile and compare the leukemias that I've shown you, derived from distinct cell types of origin, and compare these to the, the cell types in which they came from. And what we found, um, it, and the first leukemias that we profiled were ones derived from myeloid-committed progenitors. We find that there is a pattern of open chromatin that resembles um, the cell types of origin, or the fact that this came from a committed myeloid progenitor as opposed to a stem cell. And so this is still early days for this work, and we have a lot of additional profiling to do. But the goal from this uh, is really to be able to identify and ascribe uh, potential epigenetic biomarkers that we could use to determine the cell of origin of a disease. And so I think there's a lot of important uh, diagnostic and prognostic implications for this work. For example, um, five uh, AML tumors, or five patients with AML, um, that undergo routine genetic screening uh, and are all identified to have this chromosome translocation, MLLAF9, 
Um, what I hope I've shown you is that um, we can start to use some open chromatin regions that will be reflective of the cell type of origin to be able to determine, at least uh, generally speaking, what types of cells they came from. And that this has real implications for both the aggressiveness of the disease as well as the response of the disease to particular therapies. And finally, I wanted to uh, tell you about one other project that we're just getting underway in the lab. And this is uh, another area which there is no um, current clinical methods uh, or diagnostic methods to be able to determine mutational order in the progression of cancer. And so a lot of studies um, that cancerless and others have done a lot of whole genome sequencing of tumors, including AML, and have identified uh, a number of recurrent mutations that occur in, this, um, in these populations and the frequencies at which they occur. Now, what is not known from this type of data is uh, what was the order in which those mutations occurred to take you from a normal cell to the final tumor that you're, that you're um, sequencing. And we hypothesize that the order of mutations is going to be really important um, because um, we think that the mutations, the function of the mutations or consequence of the mutations is largely dependent on the context of the cell in which that mutation occurs. So we're using some very advanced mouse modeling to be able to model the specific mutations that occur in these human populations and to determine the impact of the cell type as well as the deve developmental stage on mutational outcome, as well as understanding why these pre-tumor clones might be susceptible to additional mutations, with the ultimate goal of developing new screening tools and targeting strategies to either be able to eradicate cells that have uh, undergone specific mutations that are making them susceptible to acquiring additional mutations, or to in fact block these additional mutations from occurring. And so with that, I'd like to thank uh, members of my laboratory, as well as the phenomenal scientific services that we have at the Jackson Laboratory, and that hopefully allow us to compete with modest 55 member labs. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much.